in memory of Murray Gell-Mann by Vladislav Alexander, Sasha, Stefan. In memory of Murray Gell-Mann by Vladislav Alexander, Sasha, Stefan. Murray Gell-Mann one of the great physicists of the 20th century, was born on September 15, 1929, in Manhattan, New York City. He died on May 24, 2019, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, USA. Murray Gell-Mann's unique personality as a human being, physicist, and scientific leader is very well known and has been richly depicted in many walks of life by many an author. Murray Gell-Mann, a Jewish foreign American theoretical physicist, was the winner of the 1969 Nobel Prize in Physics for his contributions and discoveries concerning the classification of elementary particles and their interactions. He was a founding member of the Santa Fe Institute, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Murray Gell-Mann was the author of, among other books, The Celebrated the Quark and the Jaguar. See footnote 1. Victor, Vicky, Frederick Weisskopf of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology was Murray Gell-Mann's doctoral thesis advisor. I knew both men personally. I am thankful to them for their support in the establishment of Stefan University. Both men had a high appreciation of each other. Here is what Murray says about his research in elementary particle theory and Vicky's scientific influence on him. See footnote 2 graduate students in theoretical physics, said Gell-Mann, who plan to study the fundamental laws of nature, are very often impressed with formalism, the formal apparatus of their subject. Learning of the beautiful equations of quantum field theory and of Einstein's general relativistic theory of gravitation, some of them dream of inventing something equally important and mathematically elegant. I suffered at least as much as other students, from an infatuation with beautiful formalism. Working with Vicky Weisskopf was a most effective remedy against the excesses of such an infatuation. He never ceases to harp on the importance of pedestrian work in theoretical physics and on understanding. By means of simple arguments, the physical meaning of a theory and its implications I point out that much of my research in elementary particle theory can be regarded as flowing from a struggle between a natural predilection for formal theory and an awareness of Vicus advice. That situation might be compared to that in the garden of live flowers and through the looking glass where an attempt to walk straight toward a beautiful flower bed was quite futile but striking out in a different direction made it possible to reach the objective. Murray Gell-Mann was my guest in La Jolla, California, during the conference. Achievements in Physics, January 28-29, 1991, which I had organized in collaboration with the UCSD Physics Department. Department Chairman, Roger F. Dashen. In honor of Keith A. Bruckner, founding member of the Department of Physics at the University of California, San Diego, UCSD. Murray Gell-Mann arrived in La Jolla on Sunday evening, January 27, 1991, and left on Tuesday morning. I met him at the San Diego airport and drove him in my red Porsche from the San Diego airport to La Valencia Hotel in La Jolla. I did not know, said Gell-Mann, jokingly, that a young physicist could afford to drive a Porsche, let alone a red one. We shared a laugh. That was an example of Murray's very well-known razor-sharp sense of humor. As I was driving from the airport to La Jolla, we discussed thermonuclear fusion physics, the nature of time, and linguistics, all of this in a matter of less than half an hour. I mentioned to him my far-fetched hypothesis on ephemerons, the particles of time. See footnote 3. He said that time is a mystery. 
On our way to La Jolla, I mentioned to him that I had had a pleasant encounter last year with Arkady B. Migdal, a famous Soviet Russian physicist. Mari Galman swiftly started to explain to me the roots of the word. Migdal. I was fascinated. During Galman's stay in La Jolla, he invigorated the conference participants with his intellect. In the presence of Mari Galman, you felt a high intellectual voltage that empowers your own mind not just at a moment but also four days thereupon. He was referred to by his colleagues as the man with five brains. Mari Galman was also known as a man who had a very low tolerance for stupidity. If you said something stupid, you would not be forgiven easily, probably never. After the La Jolla conference, I kept in touch with Murray. I would call him whenever I thought that if there was a person on earth who could answer my questions, that would be Gal Man. Once I asked him a question regarding Kabbalah. He answered it with ease, but then he said to me, jokingly, I will tell everybody that you are interested in mysticism. I was a student in Caltech, said Roger F. Dashen, in 1991, in the early and middle 1960s, and stayed there on the faculty for a couple of years afterward. I never could understand how Mari came up with all those ideas. We all had ideas, but they were small ideas, the Woodpecker ideas. The Woodpecker idea is Einstein's phrase. See footnote 4. Murray would come up with remarkable ideas every two or three days. Murray Gelman, C. Footnote 5, said Nikolai Nikolaevich Bogolyubov, in 1978, is closest to Einstein in intellectual capacity. I heard about Gelman a lot. In Russia, in 1977 to 1981, as I was working at the Lebedev Institute of Physics, Moscow, in the Plasma Phenomena Theory Department led by Viktor Pavlovich Selin, my doctoral thesis advisor. See footnote star. The physicists in Russia characterize Gelman as the one who can be compared with Einstein. In 1951, Murray Gelman was working as a postdoc in the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey. There, he often encountered Albert Einstein, usually in the mornings as they were passing by each other. Apparently, Einstein would greet Gelman in his German English, Good morning. Gelman would reply in his American English, Good morning. In an interview, see footnote 6. Gelman explained why he failed to approach Einstein and talk with him. He says that in those days, he didn't like kind of people who would approach great figures, get into a conversation with them, and report the experience to others by saying, for example, I know Einstein. That may have been quite a proper attitude for Gelman, but I personally would not have missed the chance to talk with Einstein for all the golden California. Murray Gelman added that today in 2003. He would almost certainly have behaved differently and would have asked the great physicist about his thoughts years ago when he was carrying out the greatest physics research since Newton's day. Murray Gelman's three phases in conceiving creative ideas. Murray Gelman said that there are three phases. In conceiving creative ideas. The first is characterized by hard work, days, and nights, the second by awareness that further conscious thought is useless, and the third by a sudden while cycling, or shaving, or cooking. Aha insight popping up. As to the third phase, Gelman said, this, see footnote 7. A deeper part of the human mind is presumably involved in the search how to educate heart. The search for forgiveness, compassion, it's something that truly involves, at least occasionally, the parts of the human mind that are outside of conscious awareness. So, 
there is possibly the relation between the creative thinking and art, and science, and other fields, on one hand, and the search for compassion, forgiveness, and so on, on the other hand. Compassion, says Weisskopf, without knowledge is ineffective, knowledge without compassion is inhumane, 